Hello YouTubers, fellow hams, RVers. This is part two of my DIY Wi-Fi extender and I've made a great deal of progress on the project. I've been testing it uh, in a cursory fashion, fashion with the Yagi antenna hooked up and I've been getting very very good throughput to the uh, RV parks access point which is uh, about 150 feet away um, on another building. And with the Yagi here in the uh, bedroom pointed out the window in the direction of the office. I'm getting 100% signal strength at the bridge and uh, really good results through speed test. So it's allowing me to jump ahead of the queue or jump ahead of the line as it were uh, having the strongest signal at the access point. Um, those, those access points are kind of a first come first served um, scenario or system. So having the strongest signal up near the access point gives you priority over everybody else and, and you get uh, most of the bandwidth. So in a way, I guess I'm kind of hogging some of the bandwidth when I use it, but uh, it works. Um, that's kind of the point, really. Get you the best signal from the uh, available Wi-Fi. So uh, in part of this, uh, we're going to be talking about networking and I'm going to assume or presume that you, the viewer, has at least a basic comprehension of some networking concepts uh, and at least understands what IP addresses are. Uh, so I might mention uh, some detail when I get to that point, but uh, it helps. It definitely helps in this project if you have a little bit of basic understanding of networking and at least understand IP addresses. All right, let's get into it. Now, uh, today, um, I'm finishing up the bridge end, uh, getting everything combined and hooked up there. I should take a moment here to recap what I'm doing with this extender. It consists of two major components, a bridge and an access point. The bridge with a high gain antenna will connect to the remote Wi-Fi or the internet and then come into a router uh, that then provides an internal private network for my devices here in the RV. And the reason that I do that is that all of my devices, my laptop, tablet, phone, server, uh, Raspberry Pis, can all stay configured for my internal network and they can see each other and then access the internet as needed through the extender. That way I can have the most flexibility inside the RV. Now, <clears throat> in order to uh, use the bridge and the antenna anywhere in the RV, I needed a way to run power to it from my solar system. And I wanted to simplify that and just use a single Ethernet cable. Well, I found a solution. And this is how I'm going to get power across the Ethernet cable. This is a TP-Link Power Over Ethernet Adapter Kit. Now, Ethernet cable has four twisted pairs in it, eight total wires. Your Ethernet signaling only uses two of those pairs, one for transmit and one for receive, leaving the other two pairs unused. These allow you to connect a DC power source and it will put that DC power on those other two pairs across the Ethernet cable to the other end and it'll pull that DC power back out on the uh, jack on the other end. So I opened up the uh, other end of this link kit, power over ethernet adapter kit, and then upon closer inspection of the, which is, this is obviously the far end, there's a switch right there, and it says 12 volts, 9 volts, and 5 volts. So the way this kit works, the wall wart adapter that they give you with it is 48 volts DC out which goes in at this end and is filtered spike protected with a MOV and then 48 volts goes down the unused pair on the Ethernet to this end well comes in here actually and they have a voltage regulator built into the board I thought I was going to have to put regulation at the far end to get me 5 volts for the bridge. 
which is sitting right here. But instead, the regulators are already built in. So the question becomes, since I'm targeting 5 volts, if I feed 12 volts in at this end from the solar system, which will be 13 into 14 volts, you know, 13.6 or so, um, will that provide enough voltage at this end for the regulator to work to take it down to 5 reliably? Because they they built this thing to have 48 volts sent down the wire. Obviously taking into account voltage drop, you know, if you were running this over a 400 foot or 300 foot Ethernet run, under load you'd have quite a bit of voltage drop across those wires over that distance. So the uh, the reason that they feed 48 volts at this end is so that they get a high enough voltage at this end for the regulator to to be able to regulate down to what's needed under load. And on the back they've got current ratings here. And I don't know if you can read that. It's not going to focus this close, is it? Yeah, there we go. Output, 12 volts, 1 amp, 9 volts, 1 amp, 5 volts, 2 amp. So with the 48 volt supply coming down the Ethernet to this end, you could have 12, 9, or 5 volts coming out of here. I need 5. I'm going to try to feed 12 in here in a test setup and see if I can get 5 volts out of here with enough current to power the bridge across the Ethernet cable. Alright, I'm getting ready to do a bit of soldering here. First off, this is the bridge and what I've done with it. Now. I have uh, double-sided sticky taped the um, uh, power over ethernet adapter to here. And I have uh, wound up an ethernet jumper around a toroid here a few times to uh, choke off common mode noise. Now this is not necessary for most people. Uh, I'm a ham radio operator and I'm transmitting often with radio creating an RF field that somewhat encompasses the RV. I mean, there's there's definitely going to be some RF in the air here. And uh, the Ethernet run out to the bridge is going to act like an antenna. It's going to pick up some of that um, energy. So I have these toroids on here to uh, choke that off so it doesn't interfere with the networking devices. And also conversely to help choke off some of the Ethernet noise uh, being generated by the devices so I don't have them on my radio receivers. Yeah, I know. Um, shielded Ethernet cable would be the way to go. I don't have any available, so this is what I'm doing. But this would not be necessary uh, for most of you that are just using it as an RF, uh, as a Wi-Fi extender. So that's just me. Uh, anyway, what I need to do is I need to make a little power cord to go from here to here. This is going to be the 5 volts out. This needs 5 volts in. And I have already prepared an end. This goes into the bridge and this comes from the uh, power over ethernet adapter. I just need to connect the two together. And again, I've, uh, I've wound a little toroid here around the power cord to choke off RF. But like I said, that's just uh, my, my condition here, my case. Uh, ham radio ops out there will probably have to do something similar. The rest of you wouldn't. So I just need to splice these together so that the center goes to center and the shield goes to shield. What I'm doing is uh, shield is I cut one of the wires a little shorter in this case I'm cutting the the center shorter on this end see that and the shield is shorter on this end so when these two are brought together like so, that will offset the two splices. Um, I'll have heat shrink tubing around each of them anyway, but by offsetting the two splices physically like that, there's no way that they can, if they ever did poke through the uh, shielding, they couldn't short each other. So that's why I'm doing that. I'll show you here when I get it, when I get it spliced. All right, there's our splice. Let's make sure that we've got continuity through here. Shield to shield. 
center to center and no short. All right, there's our power cord. So this goes just like that. Tuck it in and make it a little neater, but okay. There's our power connection. I'm gonna unhook this because I'll be testing it in a moment. All right, you should be able to see this. I got 13.4 volts back here on the power supply. We are plugged in to the sending end, and there's a green light on, right? And here are the two ends of my 25 foot Ethernet cable. So I'm gonna plug one end into the receiver end of the bridge here. All right, and I've got a little switch on it set to five volts. And I'm gonna plug the other end into the sending unit. And we should see a little light right here on this uh, receiver come on. And it did. All right, so we're sending 13.5 volts down. That little light came on. Let's take the multimeter. And uh, I need to cut myself some foam pads, you know, so I could just stand this up so you could see it. I'll put it back there against the radio where you see it. Kind of finding a position where my light's not reflecting off of it. It's a little tough. Can you see that? Yeah, I think you can see that. Okay. So I'm set on the 20-volt scale there. I'm going to check this end, and I should see 5 volts coming out of it. 5.17 volts. Beautiful. This is going to work. All right. Well, the next thing to do is uh, plug in the bridge and see if uh, it gives us some nice happy lights. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to grab the Yagi and uh, hook up the antenna because I don't want to run this bridge without a load on its uh, RF side. Being a radio guy, I just don't like to operate any kind of radio, even the radio inside this little bridge without a load on it. There we go. All right, can you see the front of the bridge? You can. Let's hook up the power and see if we get happy lights. I see a blinking light. And the uh, power supply back here is showing uh, 230 milliamps. That's not bad. And uh, we're seeing uh, we're seeing happy lights here. I wonder. I'm going to point the Yagi back. It's pointed in the general direction of. Oh, look at that! Solid green light on the wireless. It established a link. So even though I've got the Yagi here in the middle of the camper, pointing back through the back wall to the building, 100. 50 some odd feet away, I'm still getting a link. So it's working. Another quick note on the uh, Yagi antenna. Uh, it came with a mounting kit to allow you to mount it to a mast. But I wanted to put it on a tripod so that I could just set the tripod up after I park and uh, point it out a window in whatever direction I needed to point it. So I needed some way to mount the Yagi to a tripod. Well, I have a 3D printer. so. I fired up on shape and I threw together this quick little bracket design where the uh, antenna can slot into the top part of it and the bottom has a hole that the th that's uh, the right size to thread in the uh, tripod mounting bolt. And uh, that works just perfectly. As you can see here, the Yagi is solidly mounted on the uh, tripod and I can easily and quickly just set it up anywhere I want and point it out any window I want here in the RV. So now I have all of the hardware done and it's ready to go. I've got the Yagi and the bridge at one end that can be connected with a single Ethernet cable back to the Linksys router. Uh, let's configure everything and uh, let's get it on the air or get it connected and see how it works. So that brings us to software and networking. Now this is the hardest part of the video for me to make. Uh, I try to make my videos easy to follow and easy to understand, but we're talking about networking here and a lot of people just are not familiar with um, IP networking or internet networking. 
the only thing we really have to understand here is that every computer, every device on any network has an address. Just like houses on a street have a number, every computer has a number. And these addresses uh, in IP4, which is still widely used, uh, consist of four numbers. Each number is between 0 and 254. Yeah. Um, and uh, those four numbers together give that computer a unique address. If we're looking at the diagram of the uh, extender here, uh, the internet out here is, is going to have any number of, of possible addresses to it. Um, you have no idea what you know what the, every computer that's out there is going to have a unique address uh, the bridge itself it has to have an address so that we can get to it and it has a default address of 192.168.1.226 that's the default address as it comes from the factory We'll, we'll repeat that again in a moment, and, and I'll show it to you so you can write it down. Um, the uh, router and access point is going to create an internal network, and uh, that internal network has to have a different subnet or a different group of addresses from everything else on the Internet. And the reason for that is if your computer needs to go to uh, something that's internal, like let's say I, that I wanted to connect to my Raspberry Pi from my laptop, its address would have to be unique so that the router doesn't try to route that request out to the internet. Now there are a couple of, well there's probably more than two, but there are at least two uh, groups of addresses that are not used anywhere on the internet. They're only available for internal networking. Uh, 192.168.1. Anything from 0 to 254. Um, that group of addresses is reserved for internal networks and also 192.168.2.x uh, 0 through 254 can be used for an internal network. I set my router to use 192.168.2 for its subnet for my internal computers and that way it's different from the default address on the bridge of 192.168.1.226 uh, I'd recommend doing that. Now, as far as configuring the router, uh, every router that's out there is different. Um, depending upon what you go with, it could be different. I, I could do an entire video on each router. So I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out how to configure your router. It's something you would have had to do if you were using one at home on your home network anyway. So, you know you'll have to figure that out. But what you basically want to do is you want your router to create a wireless network just like you would at home uh, with an internal subnet of 192.168.2 so the router's address would be .1 and then the rest of your computers and devices would have their own addresses uh, 192.168.2. whatever. Uh, and, and name that wireless network whatever you want to name it. The router's creating your internal private network at this point. Uh, the bridge, however, we need to get to the bridge. And it's on a different address, 192.168.1.226 is its default address. But you can't get to that if you're on a different subnet. You see, this is why this is getting complicated. <laughs> so, um, and, and I'm sorry I can't explain this any better. I mean, you're just going to have to know a little bit about it. In order to get to the bridge, you want to plug that Ethernet cable coming from the bridge into a laptop or a computer or one of your devices, and you'll want to set that computer's Ethernet port to an address of 192.168.1.something. I use two. You could use whatever. 192.168.1.2. We'll just say that. Now, that Ethernet port's on the same address range as the bridge, and we can punch the, the bridge's address into a web browser, like I did here, 
1.226 and we get the Linksys Bridge web page. Here's where we can set up everything we need to set up for the bridge. Now this is the thing you'll have to do when you pull into a new campground or you pull into a Walmart or whatever. You'll have to connect the bridge to their Wi-Fi network. But you only have to do that once. The nice thing with this setup is you don't have to set all your devices. You know, if I pulled into a, an, a campground uh, without an extender and I wanted to use my laptop, I'd have to set the laptop to use their Wi-Fi and put in the password. And then if I wanted to use my tablet, I'd have to set the tablet to use their Wi-Fi and put in the password. I don't have to do that. All of my devices are connected to my internal network. The only thing I have to change is the bridge. So if we go to 192.168.1.226, here is the bridges, the Linksys bridges um, setup page. And what we're really interested in here is this site survey button right down here. If I click this site survey button, it's going to open a window and it's going to scan all of the networks and it's going to come up with a list of um, available Wi-Fi networks. I closed it because I need to keep my location uh, private being a YouTuber. Uh, I didn't want the names to pop up because the, the list of the uh, or the park that I'm at would show up. <laughs> but what's going to happen in that window is a list of Wi-Fi networks is going to appear and you can double click on the one you want to connect to. Walmart free Wi-Fi or Bob and Jane's RV park, whichever it is. And after you click on it, it will pull up a security settings uh, window where you can put in the password. And that's it. Um, after you've done those two things and hit apply, each, each screen has an apply button down here. Um, after you've done those two things and hit apply, the bridge will connect to that wireless network. Uh, once that is done, um, I think I have the security settings window here, don't I? Uh, yeah, I do. Here's an, here's an example. I think I'm safe with this one. Okay, here's the site survey. All right, here we go. Here's the site survey window. And as you can see, it just brings up a list of all the available uh, wireless networks that it sees, and you just double click on the one you want. I thought I had the security window, but I guess I don't. So once you have the bridge configured, you can plug it back into the WAN, W-A-N connector on the back of the uh, Linksys uh, router. And then the router will use the bridge to connect to the internet. All of your internal devices can connect on these other ethernet ports or through the Wi-Fi, and they will have internet access as needed through the bridge. Uh, and it works, it works very well. It works very fast. Um, yeah, so that's the tricky part, is, is getting that set up. Now, once it's uh, once it's connected, like right now I'm I'm connected. I'm going to go to uh, speakeasy.net and we'll do a speed test. <clears throat> and I am connected to the park's uh, Wi-Fi, the general public Wi-Fi that everybody else connects to. Uh, so usually it would be kind of slow. And let's uh, let's see what we get. That's pretty good. We're hitting almost 15 megabit per second download rate. Uh, that's 16 megabits, so that's uh, it's a uh, uh, a regular old uh, Wi-Fi 802.11g, I think. And uh, wow, we're hitting almost 10 megabit upload rate. Look at that. So yeah, um, it's working really, really, really well. All my devices can see the internet. Um, I'm happy with this, and it's uh, quick and convenient. Having only one Ethernet cable running out to the uh, bridge, I could put it up front in the cab on the passenger seat if I needed to point it at something that was out the front of the, rig, of the rig. Um, most of the time, though, I'm probably just going to be able to set it there in the bedroom and point it out one of the back windows, you know, at the at the Walmart building or uh, uh, wherever my uh, Wi-Fi source is. So there you go, somewhere around sixty bucks for all the hardware. Um, I listed all the hardware in the first video. The first video uh, is linked in the description below if you want to go and watch that and uh, or find the links for the uh, the uh, hardware that I used. 
uh, with the exception of the TP-Link um, Ethernet adapters. I'll put that in the description of this video so you can go and, and find those if you need them. So I hope you found that uh, helpful. Um, if you can, if you need a Wi-Fi extender, there's one you can put together for a little bit of work and a little bit of money, and uh, it works really well. I'm happy with it. We'll test it out uh, on the road here as we head to Quartzite uh, in a couple of weeks for Quartzfest. No doubt that I'll be uh, stopping over at least a couple of WalMarts overnight um, on the way there. So uh, we'll have a really good test of the extender in the field. I'm looking forward to that. Till the next video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.